I'm all CEO of Timber Mkwana as the Beers Consolidated Mines, South Africa and Canada Managing Director Mpumi Zagalala, as well as Anglo Americans Co CEO to Lionfro. Now, Anglo is more than, more than 100 years old, right? Yet still is a mainstay in the South African economy. It's, it's, it's still somewhat a bellwether for the South African story as the land is. Now, mining may make up, I think it's about 7% of the overall South African economy today. But it remains much larger in terms of influence. Of all, of all Anglo's asset sales in the past 20 years that have sought to become more of an international miner, it still contributes more than, I think it's 40% of our mining revenue in this country. This week, all of it is allowed to return to under lockdown today. And I've been most concerned about the spread of COVID 19 in the dead of our winter in our mining fields, in particular, where more than 400,000 workers are employed in this country. So. As the biggest employer amongst the people joining us today, I'll start with July. I, I want to start with you. How prepared are you to workers and what operational capacity are you at the moment? Uh, thanks, Ron. Um, we have done a lot of work over the last two months to prepare uh, as best as we can, given that uh, the, this pandemic is something that we're all learning every day. Um, and what we have tried to do over the last two months uh, is to put very significant and substantial controls uh, within our minds to make sure uh, that we can we can minimize the spread of the virus. Uh, so we have done some really substantial changes, uh, for instance, to make sure that people have got social distances, even in places where ordinarily you wouldn't be able to do that. Some of the examples, for instance, is that when you've got an underground mine, in our case, uh, we have created these small teams we call them cells, and we make sure that they don't mix. They come through the gates in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a clearly defined group. They go through changes in clearly defined groups, through the cage, all the way to their workplaces, through uh, as cells, and we make sure that they don't mix. The reason for that is to make sure that should there be an infection within that group, it doesn't spread to the whole mind. We actually have changed our hygienic practices to very substantially. Uh, if you walk around our mines today, you wouldn't even recognize it. I mean, you would find uh, sanitizers everywhere. Uh, we now um, disinfect our change houses every place more than twice a day to just make sure uh, that we, 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 we minimize um, the spread of this virus. But over and above that, Ron, the way we have taken our strategy and think about it is, if you think uh, is multi cordons, this is inside the game. But actually, the right thing to do is to try and prevent infections outside the gate. So yeah. one of the things that we've done is not only to educate employees in terms of what are the indicators if should you be infected? What kind of questions should you be asking? Like, for instance, if an employee has been to a funeral, we would yeah. encourage them to report those to us. So that as part of our screening, uh, we, we pick that up. We have given thermometers to all our, our employees and their families uh, so that an employee can take uh, the, his own temperature reading at home. Should that temperature reading indicate that he has got fever, we encourage them to report to us so that, in fact, we can intervene. So how do we intervene with um, a very comprehensive program we call the We, we Care? Mm. This is just to assist the employees not just inside the, 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 the fence, but outside the fence. So should he say, um, I think I might have come into contact with somebody who is infected, or I'm exhibiting um, symptoms that suggest that I'm, I'm, I'm infected, we actually send a clinical associate to his home to try and then go through a screening process that determines whether, in fact, this person should be under investigation or not, and if he is, then we'll take swab samples. Um, you probably have read in the newspapers that we have set up our own PCR testing labs. Mm. Then we'll take those samples to our own labs to test those employees so that we can get results much quicker. So these are some of the substantial changes we actually are making to ensure that we are ready uh, to cope with this pandemic. Ron, I must say you need to walk. You need to walk the, the path yeah. uh, to, to understand what has changed. I mean, I must tell you, 
I, I took um, the leadership of the NUM to, to one of our minds recently. Uh, and, and one of the things they were concerned with, obviously, is alcohol testing. As you can imagine, uh, when you alcohol test, you have to blow. Yeah. We actually have created alcohol testing where there's no contact, where you can actually just blow and completely protect it. There is no other person. It's freestanding, and you see your result. Should you have alcohol? Fortunately, under the lockdown, we didn't have alcohol, but we still had to do that. But this is to prepare for the eventuality. Now we're in lockdown three, um, mm. and obviously alcohol is not allowed. The fact that we've got such effective controls is very good. The other thing they are actually quite impressed with is when you walk through our gates, we've got mm. these multi-people scanners. So nobody actually stands in front of anybody taking a temperature. As you walk through the gates, we're scanning everybody, and we can pick up somebody whose temperature is elevated. So these are some of the very substantial changes we've had to work to do uh, to try and cope with the pandemic. This speaks to, I guess, the advantage that miners have that because of safety regulations in any case, given the industry you're in, you're almost, almost well-placed to get to monitor the outbreak of COVID in your operations, as I, as I understand. Absolutely. I mean, the, we have the systems and we have the infrastructure. Uh, I'm sure you hear from my colleagues when they talk about what we've done in our other businesses, that in fact building on the existing infrastructure has helped us a great deal. For instance, when the outbreak uh, started way back in February, very quickly we were able to recommission our hospital in Emalatheni, um, created 85 beds for isolation. We had decommissioned an, a, 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 a TB uh, isolation hospital. We have recommissioned that. We have put 20 um, beds that are actually that allow us to do that. We still had a part of the hospital which was working under a hundred odd beds. We've moved the patients out to the other hospitals and created this hospital purely uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a COVID hospital. And now we're collaborating not just with ourselves, uh, I mean with the industry peers, but with the Department of Health to try and provide um, uh, the kind of support we need. But it talks to the point you're making, given that we've got the infrastructure in place, our ability to respond and respond with speed actually is far better than most industries, I think. Um, for me, your Venetia mine, and then if I'm proper, if I'm correct, at what capacity are you operating at the moment? And just give us a bit of the change that, that you've had, had, had to introduce given the, the challenge we have now. Thank you, Ron. Uh, yes, Venetia mine is up north in Limpopo, um, and uh, we are situated within two municipalities uh, the Mosina municipality, the municipality. I think the first key thing to note is that uh, we actually had an exemption to operate when the lockdown started, but we still decided to stop the operation and conduct a thorough risk assessment. As you said, we are minors, and in our case, as an Anglo-American, our first value is safety. So we needed to conduct that risk assessment to assure ourselves that we identified all potential challenges and seek to close all those challenges as well. I think one thing to note is that as we did the risk assessment, we actually pulled our union on board as well. And following us doing the risk assessment, we actually also took the branch, uh, our Venetia mine branch, to the mine and walked, you know, what any typical employee would essentially walk through. So taking the bus, you know, you need to have temperature screening, you need to have sanitizers going into the mine. Similar to July, you walk in via an area that essentially looks at you from a temperature screening perspective. Walking in, we had to de-risk uh, our access control elements. And we, ha we are still testing for alcohol simply because we did not want to eliminate one risk and introduce another risk. And then going into the mine, we've put in various measures in place. And as July is saying, and I was at Venetia last week, mm. it feels different. And yeah. what absolutely impressed me the most is that going into the mine and walking around to the pit, to the plant, to our Venetia underground project, 
it was clearly evident that people knew what they needed to do. Everyone had their mask on. We were doing a visible felt leadership session where you go around coaching people. There was actually no need to do that. And in engaging with our teams and asking them about the measures that are in place, what was absolutely impressive for me is that the level of awareness was high, which speaks through the great work that's been done up to now around engaging people around we care. And we also spoke to our teams around additional things that they thought we needed to put in place. And similar to how our teams always work, they you know, suggested additional things, suggested things that we can essentially assist the communities with, et cetera. So it feels different and the measures are definitely in place. And Venetia Mine has also got a PCR unit as well. The one additional thing that I'll then note is that, uh, so you asked me, you know, at what level of capacity are we currently operating within? Insofar as the open pit operations are concerned, we are operating at close to full capacity. We still have a component of our workforce that's not back. And those are our employees with vulnerable conditions. And that's simply because one of the decisions that we took was that we would look at protecting those employees that have comorbidities that would put them at risk in the event of them contracting COVID, but very close to uh, operating at capacity. And clearly within our space, uh, we've also looked at how we align our supply to demand as well. And then from an underground perspective, um, we are ramping up. Um, we've essentially adopted a similar thing of saying, let's make sure that as we ramp up the underground operations, we reassess the risk and make sure that we've got all our measures in place. So the top of mind section is fully operational. And then, you, as you know, we are busy building the underground mine. Yeah. And the bottom of mine where our shafts are and our surface infrastructure, that's where we are currently busy uh, ramping up. And um, our project team is hard at play insofar as there is consent. But Rona, I'll end off by saying, similar to July, what's been mm. absolutely impressive for me is that we care does not just look at what happens within our perimeters as the mining industry. It definitely touches on what happens within our communities. We are part of our communities. And it was actually absolutely pleasing last week visiting various hospitals, visiting one of the Hoshis as well, to engage with various people and actually, I guess, align on what it is that we all holistically need to do. And in our space, this included our Limpopo government as well, and absolutely impressive. Yeah. Well, the question that moved to my mind, I understand mining, is uh, open pit mines, does it offer a health advantage over underground mining. My mining seems understanding of this disease thinks open pit mining is better suited, is better than underground mining. Is that true? I guess the difference is that with an open pit mine, it's actually not just open pit, it's mechanized mines. You typically have an employee that would either sit in their truck or their loader or their drill, etc. That's where the main difference comes in where with your, you know, and, and that actually, to be fair, takes place with mechanized underground mines as well. You've got a greater ability of practicing social distancing, where with your older conventional mines, that's where people may need to get a little bit closer as they do work as well. But I have to say, even though we don't have a conventional underground mine, Having spoken to some of the colleagues, you would know that um, Natasha couldn't join us. And Natasha is our CEO uh, from a platinum perspective. She's been hard at play looking at the measures that need to be put in place for a mandal belt, for example, in our space. And Rona forgot to mention one thing. It was absolutely impressive. I mean, you know that the DMRE has been an absolutely critical partner for us. And they visited all our minds uh, within um, the Anglo group. And uh, for us last week, they actually uh, advised that uh, the command council of the Vemba district wanted to visit, which included clearly our mayors. And um, it was clearly great seeing a short video clip that they prepared afterwards coming out of the visit. And that's exactly what we are all about. 
driving for those partnerships that seek to ensure that we ultimately achieve what's in the best interest of our employees and the communities insofar as health and well-being is concerned. Um, Rufan, I, I, I Rufan, just a quick comment for you. Uh, we happen to have both underground and open cast mines. We started off with the zero order belief that said open cast mines would be easier than underground. Yeah. But actually what we found is uh, the controls we had to put in place were just as rigorous for either of them. And, mm. and, and and actually, as, as, as I've gone underground, uh, into our underground mines, I feel just as safe uh, from an hygienic point of view as I feel in the open cast mine. Mm -hmm. And and me is right, if it's mechanized, uh, the the points of contact where yeah. potential could be infected look very similar. And the challenge is that you've got in Temba will talk about him and me sharing lessons on, so how do we make sure people get to work quickly enough uh, given the social distance, the screening, and and I was seeing the same challenges on open cast mines as I was seeing on the underground mines. Mm. And, and Samba, I, I've been to Sashian in the Northern Cape, an area that looks like I mean the perfect setting for some Mad Max to fill people. I can't imagine with the lack of people in that area where you operate, where the main uh, Kumba I know's main operation is. But you've been just how affected have you been by COVID nineteen on a, at least that on a health footing? Yeah, so I mean, we, we we clearly operate in a province which probably has the lowest um, incidence rates in terms of COVID. And clearly there's an element there around um, uh, the level of, uh, of, uh, of, of testing as well. But just like um, July and Bumi has said, we've put in place quite a number of measures to mitigate uh, against uh, the, the the pandemic, um, so so I mean from, from from day one, it was very important for us to really recognize that we had to uh, safeguard the lives of our people. And as Mbumi has said, not just within the mine gate, but also outside of the mine gate, you know, within our communities. And para and 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 parallel to that. Clearly, um, safeguarding the livelihoods and making sure that um, we've um, we've kept our operations going. Um, we are thankful um, to Minister Mantasha as well for his wisdom and fortitude in recognizing that mines, particularly, have quite a role to play given the essential services that we provide, whether it's the healthcare facilities that uh, July has spoken about. Um, and certainly as well in our case, it's it was really around some of the provisions in terms of utilities. I mean, we provide about 20 million cubes of water to the Sedibeng Water uh, Board and also to the Hamahara Municipality. Um, but in addition to that, also recognizing the significance of that uh, iron ore export uh, a channel um, because of uh, the uh, significant contribution also to, to the fiscus. So that's the responsibility that um, we, 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 have, um, we have on our shoulders. Um, we have been uh, collaborating with um, the provincial government through the leadership of the premier, uh, the municipal, uh, local governments as well, as well as our, our 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 peers as well within the industry and the strength of the collaboration has been quite profound particularly given that we are all you know united under the purpose of really making sure that we minimize the impact you know not just on the health of uh, our people but also the health of our economy at at large so 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 um the the the, the impact has been that we have so far three three reported uh, uh, cases within Kumba, but um, the management of the pandemic and really being prepared is something that we're very much on top of wrong. Mm. Now, I don't think anyone is at a place yet where they can see just how COVID-19 is going to change uh, the global economy going into the future. But Temba, before I come, to, to Kumba itself, your personal view on the pandemic 
and how it possibly changes the world in which we live. When, when you saw that oil price plunge, you must be wondering about the world you live in, the world of resources. Yeah, look, I mean, certainly, you know, this is something that um, certainly, I, I mean, I, I think for me personally, you know, in my lifetime, um, uh, I've certainly never experienced this. And in fact, um, even if I reflect on my, uh, uh, my, my late parents, you know, um, something equivalent to this was probably the Second World War, and they were effectively under the age of uh, 10. So uh, this is going to have um, 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 a, a massive change in the world in which we understand it. I think what's been really important, though, and, and significant has been, you know, uh, how our values and principles are, are, are tested. I mean, um, we work for a company, um, Anglo-American, which is a purpose-led uh, a company and um, our purpose clearly is around reimagining mining and improving people's lives and um, I'm, I'm very proud to say that you know we've really demonstrated the living of our purpose in terms of our approach to this um, uh, pandemic um, and, and in many ways yes when you think about how we interact uh, we're using a virtual platform in terms of uh, face to face Certainly, there's been lots of skills that have been learned, but we've also shown as well that we can be just as effective, even though there isn't that uh, personal and, um, and, 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 human, and human touch. And of course, going forward, we are going to have to think about what that means and how we work, how we organize. But what's really important, though, is that we're always going to make sure, though, that we take our stakeholders, our employees and contractors, and our uh, stakeholders and communities with us in terms of redefining how 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 we work uh, going forward and how we how we live and how we manage in this uh, new normal that uh, we, we we are in. Um, for us, from a Kumba perspective, um, we have been quite fortunate in that the commodity that uh, we are uh, mining and processing has really held up well. And clearly, it is a key commodity in terms of the uh, infrastructure uh, component of uh, the, the the world the world uh, e economy. And 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 clearly, we're seeing prices holding. Uh, we are also uh, are able to uh, continue uh, to um, um, uh, sell um, our, our our products, largely driven clearly by by China and the fact that China has now opened up. I mean, yeah, but talking about the, the stock price and just the, the performance of your of the metal. I mean, the world did seem a whole lot different for you. I guess for all of you in the middle of March, I think Kumba shares at that point were down some 47 percent. But since then, I mean, that, I mean, Kumba stock has more than doubled. I was looking at it just last night, preparing for this interview. But in such a global economic uh, period, right, that many expect to mirror, I guess the Great Depression of uh, 1930s and so on. Is China, is Chinese and Asian demand now one, going to be that safety net for the global economy and I guess for the resources sector? Um, it certainly is at the moment because China is now effectively back to normal. Mm. I, I mean, I, I guess, Ron, um, with most uh, sovereign states, the response around the lockdown was very much around the flattening of the curve. What clearly we saw in Asia was that because of the experiences around the SARS um, um, pandemic, they were a lot more focused and a lot more measured in terms of how they um, uh, managed the, the, the lockdown and how, how successful they have also been as well in terms of uh, the pandemic, which clearly then has allowed for the opening up and uh, clearly, China, in terms of um, still production and um, and still demand, is very much um, uh, back back to normal. And uh, as the rest of the world starts to open up and ease lockdown restrictions, they will uh, they will they will they will follow suit. But I think in many ways it's probably because of the experiences that they had with the the SARS uh, the SARS pandemic. Uh, 
think it definitely depends on like, some consumer confidence. Given where it is globally at the moment, uh, for this four to years uh, and, and for uh, the, the precious stone. Yeah, thank you, Ron. I think uh, the one thing that I'll note is that, interesting enough for us, we started seeing uh, clearly the impact of COVID insofar as our markets are concerned uh, towards the end of last year. Mm. So at the peak of COVID in uh, China, uh, particularly mainland, you would understand that most of the retailers had to shut their stores eh? simply because of what was happening. But interesting enough, at the beginning of the year, when we opened up uh, just from a midstream market perspective, we actually saw demand coming back, even from our Chinese customers. And then clearly COVID hit uh, towards the end of February, beginning of, of March. Eh? And following that, what we have seen is that primarily insofar as the U.S. is concerned right now, the retailers have had or initially had to close uh, their doors. Interesting enough, similar to what Temba was saying around China, China is definitely indeed opening up and we have seen signs of that taking place, particularly insofar as mainland China is concerned. The U.S. clearly with, you know, it reopening or seeking to start reopening itself, um, we saw demand starting to come back insofar as the U.S. is concerned. But with the current protests, which we are sympathetic to, if one looks at uh, what it is that we drive for as a business around inclusion and diversity, we've seen that the retailers have had to, yet again, um, I guess, close their doors. And, and I mean, we understand that. So I guess it's difficult right now to say where demand is sitting, simply because yeah. if you look at the entire diamond pipeline, mm. various countries from a producer country perspective are sitting at various stages of lockdown. So you know that insofar as our business is concerned, we operate in South Africa, Botswana, Namibia and Canada. We are staying very close um, in terms of what's happening in all those various countries. We are also staying very close to the entire midstream. Um, the bulk of the midstream ultimately insofar as cutting and polishing uh, takes place in India. So we are staying very close to what is happening in India as well. And then clearly from a retail perspective or what we term the downstream, we are also staying very close. I guess the one thing that I'll say is that uh, you most probably would know this, Ron, but the diamond industry is a highly resilient industry. It's gone through various challenges, I guess, in so far as the life of the diamond industry is concerned. It's gone through world wars. It's gone through various economic depressions. It's gone through large scale social changes that have taken place in society. But what has always stood the test of time has always been the consumer's desire for diamonds. Simply because what we've seen in the past is that following significant change, consumers tend to go back to what holds real value to them as individuals at an individual level. From what we see, and uh, we saw this in China as well, you'd understand that during this period, and actually we saw it in South Africa as well, you know, We've still had people who wanted to get married, for example. Some people have had to postpone their weddings, etc. In South Africa, we've seen people changing how they get married, where, you know, they would have a wedding that they host on Facebook, etc. So we suspect that as the various lockdowns start opening up, that those people who wanted to get married before would still want to get married. It's very difficult. Yeah. It's very difficult to say what will happen simply because clearly this pandemic uh, is unprecedented for all of us. But one thing that has always stood the test of time for us has been the consumer's desire for diamonds. So we remain very optimistic around the industry as a whole. July, for you and your business, I mean, this, uh, this pandemic uh, has uh, it's also highlights, I guess, environmental concern. It says around the environment, coal, of course, being one of those fossil fuels, is, is a target. What is the outlook for your sector, particularly in this environment, as the world gets more 
hello to uh, the global economic system and how it affects the, the lives of people. Um, I, I guess your your comment on uh, environmental awareness is 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 apt in the in the current circumstances because we all see the before and after pictures of cities like Beijing before. Uh, the lockdowns and after the lockdowns and how significantly clean they become. You know, you know the, the, the debate around climate change vis-a-vis -vis coal um, sometimes can sound like a one-way street, as I call it, in the sense that the emissions challenge is not just a coal issue. Clearly, coal is a big part of it, but all fossil fuels do contribute to the emissions that we see. And I think finding a responsible pathway uh, to impacting those emissions is going to be important. I can't emphasize enough the sovereign right for, in particular, developing nations to choose a fuel that will allow them to develop as fast and as economically as is possible. And coal certainly is one of those fuels that is easily accessible affordable and allows that development of power to happen. Um, there is a significant fleet of generating uh, power that is already been installed. Uh, and certainly for, for, for emerging economies, it's going to be a significant help to replace that with renewable, even if we wanted to. But I, I'm, I'm under no illusion that the, the path to the transition from fossil fuels towards cleaner, technologies um, is, is certainly underway. And cleaner coal technologies should include, cleaner technologies should not just be renewables, but actually include uh, coal in a lot of other geographies. I mean, we see, for instance, far more efficient uh, thermal power stations being built today. If you come back to what has just happened, um, what you saw in South Africa actually is mirrored in a lot of our markets uh, with lockdowns, uh, industry was not consuming power, and therefore power demand came down quite substantially globally. As a consequence, demand actually suffered quite a bit over the last two months. As, as the economies are beginning to come out of the lockdown, we're beginning to see demand begin to pick up. Um, together with that, prices suffered quite heavily. But they have recovered somewhat, but we are nowhere, 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 nowhere near where we need to. South Africa actually suffered significantly more than the other markets because um, our exports have been predominantly to India. Uh, and as you know, India had uh, implemented a hard lockdown like we did. Uh, and with that, we saw demand suffer quite badly. But it's beginning to come up. We as a company were, however, fortunate. Um, we, we took a decision probably a year, 18 months ago to diversify our markets. So we started selling some of our coal to markets like Vietnam, uh, South Korea, Pakistan. Um, and, and as a consequence of that, we actually were able to significantly mitigate um, our demand shortfall. Um, as a consequence, we've actually been able to run at somewhere between 50 and 70% um, of capacity during the lockdown. But because we were planning um, and thinking very carefully about how we would ramp up um, the risk assessment that will be required for us to run it 100%. Actually, as of yesterday, um, we have got our operations to ramp up to close to 80%, 90%, uh, in particular the undergrounds. The open cast mines were already running 100%. So I expect by the end of this month to be running 100% on all our operations. And of course, everything that I'm saying, Ron, depends on can we continue to manage infections and the impacts thereof effectively? Uh, we have a similar issue, uh, as Tembo was describing, of uh, the vulnerable employees. Uh, our employees are above 60, employees with chronic conditions. Those currently are not in the workplace. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that we can protect them. So that also is an impact of how, how productive we can be, but we manage that as best as we can. But if you ask me honestly, yeah, yeah. in the short to medium term, I think demand will come back. Mm -hmm. But don't ask me what the prices will do, because if I knew, I'd be a rich man.
<laughs> yeah, I remember just maybe I'm showing my age. Uh, uh, one was calling uh, you think South Africa, obviously, it's key for calling sports, especially with the US playing in the export market along with other. European countries. Have we have we reached that peak in terms of coal production for export in any case? Have we reached that peak? Mm. But what I promise is, is yes. Um, mm. and, and that is informed not necessarily by, um, by the fact that uh, we've got uh, the US uh, and places like Russia beginning to export to our traditional markets in Far East. Uh, they've got significant uh, logistical disadvantages to be able to compete in our markets. So they would need a far higher incentive price to be able to, to do that. Yeah. But why, why it has picked? I mean, the, the Wheat Bank uh, co basin is a fairly mature uh, co basin. The future of our coal in South Africa is actually in the uh, Lepalale water bank uh, water. coal basin. Mm. The infrastructure we require to export that coal is not yet in place. Mm. My own hypothesis is that given our competing economic needs as a country, uh, it will take us time to, ins to, to invest in that infrastructure in the water bank. And for that reason, what would then happen is, as we start ramping up the water bank, the, 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 the depletion of the wheat bank would be well underway. So we might just be able to maintain what we're currently exporting for a long time. But growing it, um, we're going to have to make some significant structural reforms, allow this economy to grow. And if this economy grows, then we'll be able to invest in the infrastructure required to grow our core export. And at the moment, I, 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 I tend to think that's not where we're going to invest as a country. Speaking to you, uh, uh, Chamber, especially in Northern Cape, with regards to expansion, what plans are there on your desk gathering dust perhaps in, to spend in the in Northern Cape? And what sort of help will you need from other translate and other state entities uh, for growth when it comes to combining, given that the country is going to be under immense pressure over the next coming years to get the economy, the economy moving at a much faster rate. Yeah, so for, for us, Ron, I mean, our current focus is very much around how do we extend the life of our operations from the current uh, 30 years uh, to, to, to 20 years, you know, um, and, and obviously, and, and, and beyond. And, and, and that's really where we see the opportunity uh, and, and clearly in that the approach has been around improving our productivities and efficiencies um, which allows us then to be more competitive in terms of the stripping volumes that we move. In addition to that it's also around the use of technology so for example we have the ultra high dense media separation UHDMS which also now allows us to effectively um, um, produce more uh, uh, product from what we would have stockpiled um, as, um, as, as, as waste um, uh, previously. Uh, and then of course, in addition to that, part of those plans are really around the exploration that uh, we, we have been doing and have been doing for quite a number of years in the Northern Cape in terms of finding other potential prospects now, clearly, a key element of all that is the stability of the, the rail and port infrastructure and also the ability of the rail and port infrastructure to be able to service our needs, you know, from, a, from an output uh, perspective. And again, I'm, I'm really very happy to say that the engagements between ourselves and Transnet have been a very positive. We are having discussions around um, the integrity and the stability of the rail line, but also around the, 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 the capacity. Uh, I mean, we make up two thirds of that um, 
uh, capacity in terms of rail and, and port. And it's very important for us that uh, um, for now and into the future that is uh, maintained. And I must say, even throughout this pandemic, um, we have been working with our um, uh, colleagues at Transnet um, as not just as Kumba, but as the broader industry with all of our other peers uh, in, in, in the Northern Cape, because it's been important for us to make sure that we keep that system um, uh, running as well. Uh, and through clearly um, looking after uh, the people and making provisions. So, for example, in the area of uh, testing, um, we have uh, one of the PCR units that uh, July was talking about, where we've established uh, testing to support our teams, our peers teams, and the teams of Transnet as well with, um, with, uh, with, with the testing. I'm very happy to say as well that with the conversations that we've had with the Transnet, with the chair and, and the CEO as well, um, they also recognize the role that they play um, uh, in the sector and that role of being, you know, an enabler um, um, for us as, as, as the industry and in particularly about the important point about being competitive because you know as 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 the industry here in south africa it's not about us competing in the south african context it's about us competing globally and clearly when you start to think talk about administered prices and the cost of infrastructure and the use of infrastructure it becomes very very important and it also guides you know our decisions around expansion and how we ensure that we continue to operate and continue to be ongoing concerns competitively in the global economy that uh, we compete in. Uh, as we get to answer this, uh, I mean, you are all people of Southern Africa, and Temba, I'm paying homage to your Mbabane roots here in July to yours in roots. What do you, what do you guys hope uh, changes in the South story after we have to life with COVID-19? Uh, back to where, where, where you know, was it before COVID-19, before February, March hit, growth wasn't good enough. We were already in yet another recession. Umi, I'll let you go first. What do we, in terms of, I mean, the president and everyone has spoken about almost reimagining the South African economy post, uh, post this crisis. Umi, if you were to sit down there and think, what uh, type of, of economy should we, we be pursuing? Because uh, clearly the one we had before COVID was in trouble, wasn't desperate trouble. And thanks, Ron. And before I answer that question, I just wanted to add to a question that you asked July and Tam, but just around, uh, I guess, uh, investments that are taking place right now. So as you most probably know, up uh, uh, at Venetia Mine uh, in the north, we are currently investing uh, 33 billion rands, extending the life of that mine to beyond 2040. And the reason why we are doing that is simply because of the actual Venetia mine resource. It is a great resource made up primarily by two primary Kimberlites, K1 and K2. And the element that I said is busy ramping up right now is the project simply because uh, we clearly do not want to lose ground insofar as the transition between the open pit operations and the underground is concerned. And similar to what Temba mentioned, Technology is going to play a massive part insofar as the development of that mine is concerned, just around the drive for more autonomous mining going forward. And that is clearly fantastic simply because one, it is safer and the safety and health of our employees would always come first and uh, it drives for efficiencies as well. In addition to that, I'll add one more point about South Africa. So when we look at South Africa as the BS, the BS group, and as I said to you, we clearly operate in uh, other countries as well. And we start looking at the prospectivity of South Africa as a country. So looking at the resources in the ground. We are blessed as South Africans because insofar as mining is concerned, we do have the resources. And it's not just from a diamond mining perspective. We've had multiple discussions around it. I mean, you've got uh, 
you know, July from a coal perspective, Temba from an iron ore perspective. We've also got Natasha from a platinum perspective. But there are other miners who mine other commodities in South Africa as well. And uh, we, from a diamond perspective, uh, see South Africa as being highly prospective still, not only from a land-based operations uh, perspective, but also from a marine perspective. So when you start looking at your West Coast areas and start their transition from land to the ocean, we do see that insofar as just the resources concerned, it possibly extends that side. So that's one of the areas that we are looking at. And then coming back to your question, so, so the one thing about South Africans is, uh, I spoke about the diamond industry uh, being a highly resilient industry, but guess what? That's exactly what we are as South Africans as well, as the people of South Africa. Hey? So I always tell people that I'm a proud South African. Clearly, I operate globally and uh, I love my entire team. But there's something about coming back home and uh, looking at what it is that South Africa as a country has been able to achieve. Uh, and uh, it's clearly over, I guess, uh, a long period of time. And I'm, And from where we sit, we do firmly believe that if we do pull together as South Africans, uh, clearly our government, which I, th I think has actually led exceptionally well during this period, you know, the various business sectors, and we've come together, as you know, particularly during this period, as the various sectors, uh, the various businesses have come together, and we started thinking about the what it is that that can possibly mean, and we've got to include our civil society as well that we would be able to drive for that inclusive economy. Um, we do think that that is what would allow us to grow as a country. And as part of that, you can't just look at big business. You've got to bring in the SMEs as well. Hey, that's a sector that can definitely grow. And that is why when you look at ourselves as Anglo-American, we invest a lot in Zimele. Anglo American or through Anglo American Zimele in enterprise development because we do believe that that has a huge role to play. So, I guess I'll end off by saying that if we all come together as South Africans, we will be able to co create the kind of future that we'd like to see as, I guess, uh, South Africans. And South Africa for me, by the way, I don't just define it as people who were born in South Africa. It's everyone who's coming from various countries simply because we drive for inclusion and diversity coming together and co-creating the kind of future that we'd like to have as a country. I guess, Ron, um, what COVID has taught us as a people, as a society, is actually how we all equal. It is an invisible enemy who has not chosen whether you are rich, whether you are poor. Um, the way we are affected might differ given our, 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 our circumstances, but none of us, none of us are immune uh, to this pandemic. So, if you, if you ask me um, and you say, as a South African, what do you wish for? I think here is an opportunity for us as a people, as a nation, to begin to imagine a completely different compact. A compact where the choices we're going to make as a people are going to define how generations long after us are going to remember those of us who, re who live through this crisis. Because what this is beginning to show is the deep fissures between the haves and have nots. You, you look at those queues where all of us are saying social distance, and you look at kilometers of queues, people are queuing for food, and then you just realize how badly and how differentiated the impact has, has become. And us as the people begin to think about an economy that can create jobs, that can make sure that all of us um, have a way without any living, I think it sh should be something that all of us uh, should have should seize our minds. We can be a rowdy nation. We are a nation of toy toy. 
We're a nation of arguing. We're a nation of going to court, arguing among ourselves. But actually, this is the time for all of us as a country, as a people, to begin to find those things that unite us. That says, actually, if we don't take the critical decisions that are required to improve our economy, to turn it around, we look, we're staring millions of jobs being lost. Mm. Millions, not thousands. I know when I looked and spoke to my mining employees, and I asked how many of them could afford to go a month without a salary, I knew what it is like for the millions of our, of our compatriots who actually go to bed without a meal. I just think this is the time for all of us to make those tough decisions. There are many things we argue about, but this is a time for all of us as South Africans to become selfless and make those sacrifices, because that's what will be remembered, at least those of us who lived in this time. Samba, your, 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 your view on just uh, our challenges going forward and, and how sober, uh, how soberly we should take them on. Yeah, for me, I, 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 I really concur with what uh, both um, Bumi and July have said. Um, and, I, and I think in many ways what COVID has done is it's provided the platform and the impetus for, for rapid change in terms of dealing with the challenges that have already been spoken of um, in terms of poverty, unemployment and inequality. But what it's also shown for me as well is the fact that because, you know, as South Africans, people would tend to say we're not very good at following rules um, and actually implementing that. And, and, and again, I think it, it really showed that, I mean, you know, given, first of all, the preemptive uh, decision on the lockdown which the state president and government took, and the fact that by and large, all of us adhered to the rules, uh, that, that, that really gave me um, a, a lot of hope. And, and I say this also in the context of, I mean, when you look, for example, at how many people die on our roads, about 15, you know, uh, plus minus 15,000 a year. Um, and the fact that people took this pandemic so seriously at all levels of, uh, of, of, of our, our society. Um, what it also does as well is that it really drives for the need for economic reform, uh, serious structural reforms in the economy. Because as July says, you know, uh, we cannot continue with the current status quo. And of course, COVID has shown the cracks in terms of the challenges that we have as a developing country, whether it's education, healthcare systems, and the ability to deal with this, and then the general state of uh, the, the, the economy. And I believe mining has a massive uh, role to play in this. Um, at uh, our Minerals Council at the AGM, we had the minister uh, talk to us, Minister Mantashe, and, and, and he said he's looking to us to lead the charge as an industry in the economic uh, recovery of uh, South Africa. Um, and um, and uh, I'm very much aligned with that. And I do believe that we, 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 we continue and can play a meaningful role in that because of what we do as miners, um, the essential services we provide, um, the, 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 the various programs that we are all engaged in, um, which really address uh, or go in some way addressing some of the challenges that we have. And more importantly, though, the fact that, you know, uh, we are leveraging the endowment uh, that um, Bumi has already alluded to of this country, which is quite significant in terms of uh, uh, global uh, terms. So, um, so, so I'm quite excited. And I also like the collaboration that we've seen, you know, um, between ourselves, government, stakeholders, and we need to build on that as the platform for driving this uh, economic recovery. 
We haven't seen the worst of the pandemic. The worst is still to come, but we are prepared. But what we really need to do is to work together to rapidly put in place the various changes that are required, particularly from an economic perspective, so as to ensure then that we minimize the long-term impacts of, of COVID, which if we don't get it right, are going to be severe and dire. So, so I'm quite excited and I'm quite excited in the role that mining and our company has, 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 has to play uh, in this. Um, because I think it'll, it, it'll, it'll take us and it'll take us to another level, uh, but more importantly, a lot quicker than it would have done without, you know, the catalyst of, 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 of this pandemic. You know, something has to be done and we all understand that and we're committed to doing that as well. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us this morning on Fin24 Speaks. Thanks so much. Um, South African, as well as the uh, Anglo American Co CEO, July Grove, and Kumba Aino. So, thank you so much for this morning. Sorry.